Thank you, Sheikh Bilal, as well, for, uh, for approaching me with this uh, idea and, and the, the effort he's put into translating the book as well and, uh, and putting this event together. So, Jazakumullah Khairan. Um, the format of today's event is that I'm going to do the introduction, and then, you know, once I've finished, I will hand over to Sheikh Bilal, who then talk about the book and about fiqh in a contemporary context. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion. You can ask questions if there are any areas uh, that are mentioned you'd like to discuss or ask questions about, we'll take the questions, inshallah ta'ala. Then we'll break for Salat al-Maghrib, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and after Salat al-Maghrib, we're finished, really. There will be food, I believe. I think we've got, uh, I think it's biryani, but I'm not sure. I can't smell it yet. But uh, if you will probably will be able to when it arrives, because we were here on Saturday for an event, and I smelled the biryani when it arrived. So I'm pretty sure we'll get the aroma uh, spreading in the room soon, inshallah ta'ala. So do watch out for that, the highlight of the evening as usual. So um, I just want to mention a few things about fiqh and its importance uh, and what brings us here today, really. Um, and the best place to start is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the most uh, vivid and clear uh, ayah of the Quran that talks about fiqh, uh, jurisprudence, you know, knowledge of the practices of a Muslim, of this deen, of interaction, of worship, it is in Surah Tawbah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِّنْهُمْ طَائِفَةً لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ And if, and had it not been that a group from the believers stayed behind نَفَرَ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ To attain understanding, comprehension, the فَقُّه which is the word where fiqh comes from, uh, a deep understanding of this deen. وَلِيُنذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ And then they would warn the people that were returning to them. So some people would go out for battle, for expeditions, for other things. But there was a group, a smaller group, that would remain behind to learn the deen. Why? So that when everybody returns, I to learn what it is that we need to practice in our lives, there is a group of people that are enabled to pass on that knowledge. So this group were actually staying behind, learning the deen. They were focusing on the understanding of the Quran, of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi And in another ayah of the Quran, which shows us the virtue of knowledge, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Qul hal yastawi ladina yaglamuna, wal ladina la yaglamun." Say, it's a rhetorical question. Do those who know, or are those who know, equal to those who do not know? So the virtue of knowledge here is a great virtue. And the scholars, uh, as mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in many hadith, will be raised ahead of other people. They'll be raised you know, as, the, as the leaders, male and female scholars, on the Day of Judgment. And Sayyidina Mu'adhi bin Jabal, one of the great companions, one of the great well, scholars of the companions, he'll be raised one stone throw ahead of everybody because he's the greatest of or among the greatest of scholars of Islam. He has a unique status. The Prophet singled him out. He was a scholar of the Quran. He was a scholar of fiqh, you know, of jurisprudence. Uh, he was a very talented young individual who devoted his life uh, to serving the sacred sciences. And one of my favorite hadith, actually, which is about fiqh, is where the Prophet ﷺ said, Man yuridillahu bihi khayran yufaqihu fid deen. Whoever Allah wants good for, he gives him fiqh of this deen. Yufaqihu fid deen. And I'm deliberately not translating that word fiqh a lot because I want you to embrace the word itself because it can be translated as jurisprudence, as understanding or deep understanding, knowledge, comprehension. Um, but it, it means a, a higher level of understanding, a depth of understanding, whereas what the words mean to know, to, to be aware and so forth. This, the word fiqh has a, has a greater meaning, a greater depth of understanding. So in this hadith, the Prophet is telling us that if you want good for yourself in reality, you attain the knowledge of this deen, you attain understanding of this deen. Why? Because the one Allah wants good for, he gives him understanding of this deen, of this beautiful religion. And in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that's in Bukhari, and in another hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, خِيَارُكُمْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ The best of you in the pre-Islamic phase of ignorance or, um, you know, misguidance. Uh, Islam. The best of you at that time or the best of you in Islam, which applies to all of us because I think we all come from a past where you don't know 
where we were or what we were doing, and we've changed, alhamdulillah. Um, I mean, uh, and then the Prophet added at the end, إِذَا فَقُهُ If they have fiqh, understanding. So the best of you in pre-Islamic times are the best of you now, if you attain knowledge, if you gain understanding of this deen. So these few ayat and hadith just show us the immense importance of learning the faith of Islam and learning the deen of Islam. Now the word fiqh mentioned in each of these doesn't necessarily refer specifically to Islamic jurisprudence. The word fiqh in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu the word for uh, fiqh that we use today was slightly different. Terminologies develop over time uh, and you know scholars and you know uh, it's just agreement isn't it? A terminology is what people agree to use for certain things. Um, and bringing this to our world today, you know, where we are in terms of our learning, in terms of our role or our position in the world as Muslims in the 21st century, we're affected by a lot of things. You know, things affect us from uh, external factors uh, and internal factors. Some things we have, um, you know, inherited, you know, these issues that affect the Muslims, Palestine, you know, Kashmir, and some things have ar arisen in our lifetime. And we come to face them, such as maybe the Syrian crisis and other things, you know, challenges such as the gender dysphoria thing and before that, it was other things. And so we're always going through challenges as Muslims with issues around us. Um, and many of these are passed down to us and we have to deal with. And the, the, the need for change or engagement is always there, the world we live in, the society we live in. Um, but that engagement and that change starts within ourselves. You know, we, we want to change others or change what's happening around us. We really have to start with ourselves and change ourselves and look at ourselves and where I am. What am I doing? Uh, am I getting things right? Have I learned my religion? Do I know how to practice my faith? Do I know, am I confident in my beliefs? So change occurs at an individual level first and then at a family level. You know, you, many of you are parents here and part of family units and you'll know that Import the importance of educating one's family and providing uh, good role models uh, and you know uh, sort of safe spaces for people to develop in and to flourish, and then that becomes the means of a community uh, flourishing. Uh, and you know when I say I want to be a better human being, I want to be a better neighbour, I want to be a better father. In reality, what we're saying, a mother, daughter, etc. In reality, what we're saying is I want to be a better Muslim. You know, because a Muslim is a good neighbor, is a good spouse, is a good child, son, daughter, etc. Uh, these are not, you know, separate or distinct from each other. They are one and the same thing. In order to achieve that, we need to um, look at this topic today, I suppose, which is the topic of fiqh, i.e. Islamic law, Islamic jurisprudence, uh, which is usually defined as something like, you know, knowing or learning the detailed, um, practical or, you know, uh, uh, rulings or verdicts of our religion, i.e. your worship, your interactions with others, uh, from their sources, you know, learning where they came from, where these rulings are derived from. Um, and to be honest, um, I don't know if Shiv Bilal would agree with me or disagree with me, I don't actually know the statistics, but I would say, and you know, we're both bibliophiles, um, that hundred, I firmly believe that there's no other topic that has as many books dedicated to it than Islamic jurisprudence. You look at tafsir, you look at sirah, hadith books, there's thousands of volumes in those areas, but in, the term, in terms of fiqh, Islamic law, Islamic jurisprudence, it's just beyond imagine, imagination that how much has been written, authored, reviewed, commented upon, marginalia, it's, it's an ocean. Uh, you know, surprisingly, you think, oh, isn't tafsir the most, or is it? No, I would really think Sheikh Bilal fiqh yeah. is without, a, you know, without a doubt way ahead in terms of the volumes of books you'll find in libraries, in any, you know, student, sheikh, teacher, uh, you go to their homes, the fiqh will be the main books there. You know, you go to an Islamic library, you'll find the most volumes, and even books that we haven't discovered or, you know, remain in manuscript form uh, on, on this topic of, of fiqh. Uh, so that tells us something very important. It's a very crucial element of the Islamic sciences. You know, it's a very important, uh, because it deals with our everyday behavior. You know, when you learn about, you know, um, social etiquettes, when you learn about halal and haram, what to eat, what you can't eat, diet, you know, and you learn about covering oneself or certain practices, your ritual worship, ritual purification and, and similar matters, you know, your financial issues, your transactions. This all comes under the topic or the banner of fiqh, which is 
affecting us right here today. You know, this right now, there's a, there's a fiqh ruling being applied in everything we do for every moment of our lives. So how do we deal with other people? How do we dress ourselves? How do we do things? Um, and, you know, I would say it's, you know, um, in, in a good way, it's a very imposing concept, Islamic law. You know, it's a very, I uh, mean, imposing in both ways, in that it's very dominating and very imposing as it imposes itself. It's very striking. It's very, you know, it's amazing, you know, what it does for us, the, the guidance it gives us, the, the you know, the, the limits it sets us to protect us, you know, to, to benefit us. And this is, this goes back to what we'd call the maqasid uh, al-sharia, uh, the, the objectives or the goals and purposes of why we have law in the first place, which is to protect, which is to, you know, give, provide a, a safe platform for religion, for life, for transactions, for exchange of wealth. Uh, and among those traditions, which is where I'm going to hand over now, Sheikh Bilal, um, is purification and prayer. You know, simple as that. The, the fact that we have to pray uh, uh, five times a day uh, for the rest of our lives. You know, I was in hospital, in a, in a hospital bed with a metal rod in my leg and unable to move. You know, I couldn't get out of the bed. And I had to apply the rulings of fiqh. I was doing tayammam. You know, I couldn't literally get out of my bed and do anything, go to the bathroom, etc. So I had to do everything in the space of this, you know, few feet. And, you know, there was people helping me. And that's why I love the NHS. You know, they are superheroes. Uh, the nurses, the doctors, the, the surgeons, you know, I, I truly appreciate, truly appreciate things when you experience them uh, and you have to go through challenges. Uh, but I was applying fiqh at that time, you know, I was having to adjust and apply the rules of the yamam and other things uh, in that situation. So it's something that we can't escape even in the most difficult of situations. There's something called Salat al-Khawf, the prayer of fear, which is in the book itself, you know, how do you pray when you're being attacked by an enemy or fear for your life? Right? We can't escape this fact of prayer is five times a day and it's an obligation upon us. And if the Prophet, the Sahabah, uh, uh, send salutations of peace upon him and the Sahaba and the Muslims you know, didn't abandon this act regardless of the situation or, you know, one act is if you're going to die then you obviously save life. Uh, but they, they made, Allah made laws for us to pray and to fulfill this duty even in the most difficult of circumstances i.e. you adjust to deal with danger then it shows us how important this topic is today and, and the book that we're going to be talking about later. Um, so it's not so, uh, and, and, uh, and to go to the book a little bit, although I believe that Sheikh Bilal, there are hundreds and hundreds of books written on this topic of purity, purification, prayer, um, and there's probably many that are in manuscript form, probably some undiscovered, uh, like I said, hundreds, thousands. Um, so the fact that we have picked one is not a coincidence, it's not a random thing. Uh, the book Nur al Idah is a very unique book. It is, is a book that has been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately, but a very uh, famous, very uh, prominent book that the scholars around the world, even scholars from other schools of thought, have studied, have learned, uh, have memorized. The text is memorized by students as they learn uh, Islamic jurisprudence and has definitely had a, a massive impact. In fact, I believe most of you here today have probably benefited from this book, even without knowing it. You know, often you ask a question to an imam, a teacher, you know, etc. The answer is from Nur al Allah, if it's about prayer and purification and fasting as well. There's a big chapter there. Uh, you know, often the, the information you're relayed is from this blessed book uh, written by the author, Imam uh, Abu Ikhlas, Hassan ibn Ammar al-Shurum Bulali, rahimahullah ta'ala, who was from Egypt, rahimahullah, about 400 and 50 odd years ago, he was uh, with us. Uh, you know, he, he, he left his legacy behind. Um, so this, the benefit in, you know, his work is uh, immense. You know, it's a brilliant starting point for your journey into Islamic jurisprudence to learn about what you're going to be practicing every day, but also to learn a tradition. Because the book is written in a scholarly uh, methodology, you know, a, a methodology to bring you into studying the Islamic sciences and to feel that rich tradition uh, of Islamic jurisprudence of the Islamic sciences. Uh, but also, and you know, related to, to maybe the title of today's topic, um, we maybe need to look at this discipline in a contemporary context. Uh, how do we apply these rules today? What's changed? Um, you know, are these works relevant? How relevant are they? Um, and you know, the whole concept of fatwa, I suppose, which is another much deeper topic, sinat al-fatwa, you know, the methodology 
and presenting of Islamic legal verdicts for certain circumstances. But like I said earlier, and I'd like to finish off with and, and bring it back to this, uh, that understanding, that journey, uh, is all about the world we live in. And that brings us back to ourselves and the changes that we need to make within ourselves first, and then hopefully pass on and spread to others, inshallah ta'ala. So I'd like to thank Sheikh Bilal once again, and hopefully pass on to him now, uh, to continue and talk about not just the book but also the concept of fiqh and the scholarship behind that inshallah ta'ala barakallahu feekum bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa sallallahu ala sayidina muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli waftah alayna hikmatak wa shafi' alayna wa rahmatak ya dha jalal wal ikram اللهم نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذاك وتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على تمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله والدعاء له دعاء الخاء ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى is gathered us uh, to the, you know one of the greatest discussions and like Sheikh Wasim was saying that this science is here for a greater purpose. The purpose is to procure benefit to us in this world and the hereafter and remove harm from us in this world and the hereafter. And the Sharia came to refine our nafs ultimately. Okay, this fiqh and these rulings that we're learning, they're here to refine our soul and our nafs and our, what Freud calls the id. Okay, if you, you know Freud in psychology. The nafs, the best translation for it is the id. Some translate it as the ego. It's not here to serve our, our desires. I, it's not here because, you know, to make us happy and allow us to choose what we want. We want to find out what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us so we can follow that and ultimately attain bliss in the hereafter. And, you know, there's, we know that there's a problem in our community with people very, who are very quick say this is halal, hadha halal ma hadha haram. Allah says don't say this is halal, this is halal. And we even have a word for them, haram police, don't we? <laughs> We've even given, given them a word. It's so common and, and frequent that people are just quick to, to use this. And we really knew the difficulty of, of fiqh, even a, a small manual like this. There's so many things we need to consider. You know, where's this pronoun going back to? Is this the correct pronoun? Have I understood this correctly? Do I know the, the reasoning behind this? Okay, one of the most important I think for the jurist today or the mufti today is to figure out what is the, the illa, what is the reasoning behind the ruling? Instead of just giving a ruling, a blanket ruling, why? Why is the ruling being given? Because that may change depending on the circumstance. Okay, and once we know the reasoning, and you know, the, the Hanifis, they were very, very concerned. And the jurists in Iraq, the, they call this the school of the Iraqis, those in Iraq, their methodology was, we want to find out why the Messenger of Allah said this. We're not just blindly following the Hadith, but why did the Messenger of Allah say this? And once we know why, then we can apply it to other areas in our life. And it's one of the most difficult Difficult sciences, you know, me, you, you know, Sheikh Wasim both studied and we you know how difficult it is to study jurisprudence and you've got all of these books and the usul and it's a lifetime's uh, amount of, of dedication, okay, and it's more difficult than splitting a hair in two. If you look in the taqrib of Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, it's a book of narrators of hadith from the main text of, of hadith. And you'll find about 4,000 odd scholars in there. These are hadith scholars. Okay, how many of them can we say were mujtahids? You won't, won't find more than 30 of them. That we say they were proper jurists. They can understand the Quran and the hadith and extrapolate rulings from. So hadith, yes, okay, you can memorize it and that's fine. Memorize, you know, insert my hadith and pass it on your hadith. Doesn't mean you understood the hadith. Doesn't mean you understood the hadith. Once uh, 
there was a king in Andalus, Muslim Spain, and um, there's a Zahiri school uh, was quite widespread in Muslim Spain, and a great scholar there named Ibn Hazm, he's a great alim, you know, a person of virtue, uh, and he, you know, was a leader of that, that school at that time in, in Andalus, uh, and he wrote a book called Al-Muhalla, you know, numerous volumes, and the king, this king in Andalus, he got quite, quite impressed by the methodology of Ibn Hazm. So he decides to, to gather some jurists together, and he sits them down. And Ibn Hazm's school, the Zahiri school, is based on very, being very literal. Okay, it's kind of opposite to the Iraqi school, where they want to find out why, you know, the Messenger of Allah said this. It's just very literal. The text says this, and, you know, and that's it. And this king, he was impressed. You know, it's a Quran and Sunnah, you know, not, you don't need to use reason or, or analogy or any analytical reasoning. And he sits him down, he says, okay, let me ask you a question, but nobody's allowed to say that Imam Malik said this, I don't want to hear that, or Ibn Sahnoon, or this is from the Mudawana. He says, nobody's allowed to speak and say anything about this. Answer me this question. And he said, okay. They're all silent. And he says, person who prays and makes some mistakes, makes some errors in the prayer, okay, you jurists say, Imam Malik says, that if the person, it's obligatory for the person to repeat the prayer in the time of the prayer, but if the prayer time ends, he doesn't need to repeat it. So though those you know, mistakes, not ma major ones that completely invalidate it, you, you say, okay, that the person has to repeat the prayer as long as the prayer time is remaining, but when the prayer time ends, he does, does have to repeat it. So the, the king saying, you know, I want proof, Quran or Sunnah only, show me. Don't say Malik said this. And all of them, are, all the jurists are silent. And then they all turn to, you know, the one who had the most knowledge in the, in the gathering. And they, they look at him and they're, they're waiting for a response. And he says, this person narrated from this person, from this person, from this sheikh, from this sheikh. Okay, back to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That once a Bedouin came to, the Messenger of Allah, his name was Khalad, this, this Bedouin, and he came and he prayed in front of the Messenger of Allah. And the Messenger of Allah said, Go back and pray, because you didn't pray. So the man he prays, he was praying quickly. <laughs> he used to be like very hasty in his prayer. He prays and he comes back to the Messenger of Allah. And the Messenger of Allah says, Irja wa salifa inna kalam tu sal. He says, go back and pray, because you didn't pray. So he goes and prays, and he comes back. And the Messenger of Allah says, go back and pray, because you didn't pray. He prays, he comes back, and the Messenger of Allah says it to him again. He says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I swear by the one who you know, sent you with the truth, this is all that I, <laughs> I can do. Teach me how to pray then. And then the Messenger of Allah says, if you, you know, when you recite, and you stand, stand for a satisfactory amount of time. When you bow, bow for a satisfactory amount of time. When you go into Roku, go into Roku for a satisfactory amount of time, and so on. Okay? And so the Jurist, he says that this man, the Messenger of Allah, knew he had prayed like, like that maybe for many years. He said, become Muslim, but not once does he tell him to repeat those prayers. No, what, he only told him to repeat the prayer there and then in the time. He never told him to make up any other prayers. It's an understanding. Okay, the sunnah is more vast. The pure sunnah and that understanding is more vast than our intellects. You know, that's why, you know, there's, 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 a, there's an order to things. If we don't find something in the Quran, then we go to the hadith. If not hadith, then we go to consensus of the ulama. 
if there's nothing in those three, then we can use analogy. So analogy is the weakest, because analogy, you can make an error. It's easy to make an error, okay? Once uh, Atmash, he see we start with Abu Hanifa, and he's asking Abu Hanifa questions. You know, the great Imam Abu Hanifa is, you know, great, one of the greatest jurists, one of the earliest jurists. And, you know, he met some of the companions of the Prophet as well. You know, that's why this knowledge is not, is taken from the companions to their students, to those scholars, and passed on through the ages, from alim to alim. That I heard from my sheikh, who heard from his sheikh, who heard from his sheikh, okay, all the way back to the Messenger of Allah. I used not, you know, I just memorized a few hadith from Bukhari, or, you know, I've got a translation of the Quran, and, and that's it. We don't need these, these scholars anymore. Okay, so Amash is, he, Amash is a great scholar, hadith scholar. Okay, he's asking Abu Hanifa questions. And Abu Hanifa is answering. And Atmash says, you know, where are you getting these, these answers from? You know, I never heard this. These are complex issues. Abu Hanifa is just answering. He's saying, where are you getting this from? Abu Hanifa says, you narrated it to me. <laughs> from so-and-so. From so-and-so. You narrated this to me from Shabi. You narrated this to me from Ibrahim. Meaning, Amashi he transmitted the hadith, but he didn't know how to extrapolate the ruling from it. And then Amashi says, Ya ma'ashal al-fuqaha, antum al wa nahnu sayyadila. He says, oh company, assembly of jurists, you're the doctors, and we are the pharmacists. Okay, two popular professions in the Indo-Pak <laughs> community, yeah? Either pharmacists or doctors or... Now solicitors and the pharmacist, he doesn't know how to, to deal with diseases and cure people. He just knows that this is this medicine, this is this colour, you know, I'm going to give you this. The doctor knows. The doctor knows what to prescribe. The doctor knows the remedy, what each me medicine does and what effect it has. So the jurists, they're the doctors. They're the doctors. The Hadith scholars there, pharmacists, they have a role to play. Hey, but just because you memorize Sahih Bukhari doesn't make you a jurist. It doesn't mean you understand <laughs> you know, what you're transmitting. The understanding has to, has to come with it. Okay? And you know, this is why you know, we, we go back to what our Imams have said. Okay, and the scholars over the years, they refine you know, the opinions of those, those great Imams who codified uh, this science, okay, almost a hundred years after the passing away of the Messenger of Allah, salam, they start to codify this science to make it easier for us not to make life difficult. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Okay, you, might, you get somebody saying, oh, you know, um, are you going to pray your prayer according to the prayer of Abu Hanifa, or according to the prayer of the Messenger of Allah. What nonsense is this? As if Abu Hanifa was praying according to the Bible, or you know, <laughs> some other prophet. It's according to the, the Messenger of Allah. Well, it was transmitted from, from the companions. Okay, and that's what we rely upon. And we need to be very careful, okay, about issuing, you know, rulings and Sheikh Abdul Razak al Halabi, rahimahullah, he was one of the great uh, jurists of, of Damascus, he passed away. He you know, read the Hashif ibn Abidin, which is, you know, probably depending on which print you get, at least 10 volume book. He read that and taught it 13 times in the Umayyad Mosque, the Grand Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. You know, we can't even imagine reading it once. We'd love, we'd love to read it once. He taught it 13 times. I, but when people used to come and ask him a question, he'd say, go to this book, look at that page. You'll find your answer there. Or open the book. Here's the page number. Take a look there. Have a look. There's your answer. I didn't, he doesn't say, you know, this is probably a trap we, we I fall into. 
myself, and Sheikh Wasim <laughs> maybe falls into it as well. Yeah, our teachers in, in Yemen, you know, when we're discussing uh, rulings and going through texts, and you say, you know, what's, okay, what's the ruling on this? Somebody say, this is not permitted, or this is, you know, sunnah, or this is, you say, no, no. Tell me where it says, did Ibn Hajar said this? Aramli said this, and Nawi, what did he say? This is not, not the way you, you do fiqh. You bring the text, tell me which scholar said it. Okay, and Abu Hanifa, he was very, very cautious as well about saying something is haram or something is fard. Because he's speaking on behalf of Allah, on behalf of his, Allah, his messenger, alayhi salatu salam. It's a responsibility, huge responsibility. You know, you'll find, you know, from the, the way they speak, they say, I see this as disliked. Or I see this as, as prohibited. Not Allah sees it as prohibited. And we know Abu Hanifa actually coined another category of legal rulings just to avoid saying something is haram. So instead of haram, you say makruh tahrimi. It's not haram, but makruh. Tahrimi, those of you who studied, you know, fiqh know what that means. I, the fear of, because haram is something serious. Haram is something serious. Okay, and these fiqh rulings, they change, they can change. This is what, you know, how do we merge the, the traditional I, with the contemporary? Many, you know, 100 years ago, things were very, very different. Even 20 years ago, things were very, very different. The world is developing and changing all the time, okay? And it's up to our ulama to keep up with that change. And, you know, we need to go back to understanding the reasoning behind rulings. Tahqiq al-manat. What is the actual understanding and reasoning that this ruling is based on? Uh, Ibn Abidin in his Sharh Uqud Ras Mufdi, you know, he says that, um, let's say we have two opinions in the school that have both been verified as sound. So maybe one text says this is sound, another text says this is sound. Okay? One of the things he says is one of the ways we can give preference over one of the other. He gives about 10 different ways, 10 different scenarios where we give preference. But one of the things he mentions is that one, it might be easier for people of a certain time. It might be more harmonious to say awfaq, okay, and some texts they say arfaq or ashal. It might be easier for the people of that time, or it's, therefore it's more appropriate to use that particular opinion. You know, where, where are we going wrong? Take example for tar of tarawih, performing khatam tarawih, which we have sp spoken about a couple of times. Bilal's, <laughs> Bilal's smiling, <laughs> maybe he's heard me speaking about it. Okay, the text is say sunnah to do a khatam of the Qur'an in Ramadan in Tarawih. I believe they, they say if it becomes difficult for people and it puts people off coming to the Tarawih prayers, then the Imam shouldn't recite a khatam. He just recites the smaller chapters to make it easier for people to, to cope with and attend. This is from texts that are 800 years old. In Muslim lands, we're not talking about here in the UK in 2022. These are texts in Muslim. Even one, one Imam from the Hanafi school, he says, even if somebody just recites a Fatiha and one verse in the Tarawih, that's fine with me. I don't consider that as disliked because people, they, it's too much for them. And you get imams, no, we have to perform a khatam. If we want to do the sunnah of, of khatam, you know, the tarawih is at 11 o'clock though, half past 11. And then suhoor is at half past one. <laughs> and then fajr is at 2, two, two a.m. And then we've got to go to work at eight, 9, take the kids to school. And then 18 hours fast, but we still insist on doing the khatam. I, understanding, rulings change, okay, 
and customs, they're taken into consideration. Okay. Ibn Abidin, Wal Urfu, Fishari Lahu Tibaru, Lida Alehi Hokmu Kajudaru. He says in his Ukud Rasmul Mufti that Urf, that customs, they are to be taken into consideration in the Sharia. And sometimes a ruling might be based on those customs. And when the ruling is based on customs, I, then those rulings can change depending on the time and the place and the customs. Okay, if it becomes dominant. You know, for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, the early jurists, Abu Hanifa in particular, he says it is prohibited for someone to take a payment for teaching the Quran. That's not, not permitted. It's an act of worship or for leading the prayer or calling the adhan. You can't take a payment for doing an act of worship. Later scholars, they changed the ruling. They diverted from Abu Hanifa's opinion. They said, yes, we're going to allow somebody to take a payment for teaching the Qur'an. And because if not, nobody's going to want to become a Qur'an teacher. And nobody, nobody's going to learn the Qur'an. And this contradicts the whole point <laughs> of, our, of our religion. This is the, one of the most important things, the Qur'an. We can't have this. They diverted from Abu Hanifa's opinion or giving a waqf, an endowment, with something that can be moved around. Abu Hanifa says you can't make an endowment with something that can be moved about. Endowment is for building mas masjid, madrasa, hospital. As for you, know, you donating your Quran mushaf to the mosque, or a hat, or your dhikr beads to the mosque, no. Abu Hanifa says you can't do that. Imam Muhammad says no. We're going to allow it now because people, it's become widespread. Widespread. Or if it has to be taken into to account, customs, you know, and, you know it's, it's something that we're missing. Abu uh, Ibn Abidin, he poses a you know, hypothetical question that these custom, somebody might ask, these customary practices, what we call urf in Arabic, it changes from time to time. Okay, can, you know, the Mufti or the Alim contradict that text? What's already been mentioned, this is the position in the school based on the Orf and follow the new Orf? He says, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, it can change. Okay, and in the Qunya, he states that the Mufti or the Qadi, they can't even, they're not even allowed to make a judgment according to the apparent rulings in the text in the madhab, in the school, and forget about this or forget about customary practices. We, we can't abandon that. Okay? And that means we need to understand. One uh, kid, he comes to an imam in a mosque. He says, uh, is spice halal? Or haram? He says, no, spice is, spice is okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We know what spice is, maybe you know what spice is, it's a drug that kids are taking. <laughs> it's not just something, masala that you're going to put in your, you know, biryani or whatever. We need to understand the language. If, if we don't understand the language, first and foremost, f forget about giving a fatwa. So we need to understand the customs of people before we are quick to, to give rulings. Otherwise, open the text and say, there you go, Abu Hanifa says this, I don't know about spice, I don't know about, don't be, a, be ashamed of saying I don't know, I don't understand. Ask, or ask the people, فَسَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ The Quran says, ask the people of the remembrance if you don't know. And that's why, for example, medical issues, you know, this is another problem. We've got jurists and muftis and scholars giving opinions about medical matters. It's not a our field. <laughs> it's not our field. We need to ask medics, we need to ask the doctors what, what they think and then, then give the ruling. It's not a really religious matter. We go, go and ask the professionals, psychologists, the doctors and nurses, what, what's their view? Okay, and maybe on the flip side of that, you know, somebody gets a PhD in medicine, they think they become knowledgeable in every single affair, <laughs> even in religious matters. 
so I've got a PhD in medicine. It means I, I know everything now. Eh? Uh, subhanallah. Uh, we know Shafi'i, Imam Shafi'i. I'll finish off here and speak more about the book. It's been going on for a while. Imam Shafi'i, the great Imam. We know that he changed many of his views after moving to, to Egypt. He's buried in Egypt, he passed away in Egypt, rahimahullah, at a young age as well. And in the Shafi'i school, we have what we call the Madhab al Qadim and al Madhab al Jadid, the old school. And the new school, the old school was in, in Iraq. That was, you know, um, recorded by students in Iraq. The new school is Al-Um in, in Egypt. You know, and the, all of the opinions, they're according to the new school apart from a handful of, of matters. You know, so Orf, changing of times. And, you know, we're, we're living in an age where we think things change so quickly. The acceleration of change is unprecedented in our, in our day and age. You know, and it's our duty to, how to keep up with that. Uh, as for the book, first of all, my apologies. The book was held up, printing of the book. Uh, a thousand copies were ordered. They were getting printed in, in Bulgaria. This was weeks ago. It should have been ready. The printing company, they closed for a week. They reopened, they printed the book. And then the, the machine to glue the covers, that got broken. So we said, look, just send 100 copies to us for now, if you can. You know, we need them by, by Monday. They're in transit now, and they're going to arrive tomorrow. <laughs> so just, just one day. It's the will of Allah, obviously. It's meant to be. So via guidance hub, inshallah, you'll be able to, to get your copies. Inshallah, I'll sign them. And you'll be able to get them via, via guidance hub, inshallah. People who know them anyway, they can obviously just come to my house and, you know, I'll, I'll give them copies uh, and closer students. Uh, but my sincere apologies for that. It was planned well in advance that they'd be here, but it just wasn't meant to be. It wasn't meant to be. I, the author is, you know, Hassan ibn Ammar ibn Ali, Ashurun Bulali. Rahimahullah, he's an Egyptian scholar. Uh, <laughs> Gemma's smiling because she just married an Egyptian <laughs> So her husband will be happy if she buys a copy <laughs> He's an Egyptian scholar and he was born in 1586 Okay, and brilliant mind One of the great, great ulama of Al-Azhar University Okay, and Hanafi Juris Al Wafaya Shadili. Okay, he's a Shadili as well. And his sincerity, his name is Abu Al Ikhlas, the father of sincerity. You know, and this book is a testament to his sincerity. Because in, in the Hanafi school we have many texts, all the texts, you know, Kitab al Quduri and the Wiqaya and all these of kinds of Daqaiq, great works. But this work, for some reason, and, uh, you know, I believe it's due to the sincerity of the author. And then, inshallah, make me sincere as well, translating it. This is work is accepted in all Hanafi lands in the current era. You know, so some places here, you know, they'll study certain texts only. They might start with the Wiqaya and then move on to Al-Hidayah and other texts. I put this text everywhere. You go to India, Pakistan, you go to Syria, Egypt, Turkey. China, Uzbekistan, these are all Hanafi dominant lands. This is the first book. And you know, he only lived, you know, 400, 450 or so years ago. It's a testament to sincerity that the Ummah has accepted his work. SubhanAllah. And it's called Nuru Idah Manajat al Arwah, the light of clarification and the salvation of souls. So the purpose is to give you light and clarification and grant you salvation of your, your souls. And he just restricts it to the prayer and fasting. That's the only two subject matters of the text, purification, prayer and fasting. Maybe he bases on the hadith of the Bedouin. Uh, you know, the hadith of the Bedouin who comes to the Messenger of Allah. He says, oh, Messenger of Allah, if 
I do the obligatory prayers. And if I fast in Ramadan and stick to the halal and avoid the haram, will I enter Jannah? Will I enter heaven? The messenger Allah says, yes. Yeah. And the man says, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, I'm not going to do anything more. I'm not going to do anything extra. Okay, maybe he couldn't afford to pay zakat or go on hajj and those things. He said, I'm not going to do anything extra. And the man walks away and the messenger Allah says, Qad aflaha in sadaq. He said, if he's speaking the truth, he's successful. He's going to be successful. So that the prayer and fasting is salvation for us. It's security for us. And, uh, you know, this, this book, you know, it, it deals with those subject matters. I did a chapter of Zakah, which is from my own uh, notes, and to the end of it, just to be a bit more complete. Uh, so there's more... Um, Areas that are covered in the immediate Muslim's life or ye yearly life of a Muslim. And uh, subhanAllah, the Imam passed away in the year 1069 after Hijrah, 1659, in the, in the 21st of Ramadan, on Friday afternoon. Rahimahullah. This is when, when he passed away. Uh, and he used to be called the shining light of Al-Azhar. This is what the ulama of his time called him. He's the shining lamp of Al-Azhar University. SubhanAllah, one of the greatest Islamic universities. And he has many other books as well. He wrote over 30 different texts. And some, some of the issues and details and nuances that he goes into, you know, I think SubhanAllah, um, and the ishtihad that he has in you know, delving, he's got like a, a treatise about students who are in, you know, a seminary and they're taking, they're living off the endowment of the seminary, but they go missing from classes. <laughs> and is, is it permitted for them to keep on using that endowment? He's written a book all about that. And he's written another treatise about the permissibility of wearing red, which is a common issue, and many, many other of a book, Rahimahullah, and detailed issues and about mixing between madahib as well. He's got a book about that and taqlid and aqidah as well in theology and doctrine. He's written books as well. Uh, you know, such a great, great, great iman. Uh, in this book, you might ask, you know, why have I published this book when there's already a translation out there? So the previous translation, um, I found that it wasn't clear because the author has actually merged uh, his own notes and own commentary within the actual text of uh, the original Nuru Ida, and it's difficult for you to decipher what's, what's what in there. And I aimed this, this print really at students of knowledge. So my intention was that you're going to study this with a teacher. So what I did is I added, you've never seen this in any other Islamic primer that has been translated into English. I added these extra lines at the bottom of each page. So you can take notes because I want you to study it with a teacher, not just to buy it and put it on your bookshelf, you know, and admire, you know, the cover, <laughs> nice hardback cover, alhamdulillah. And there's plenty of space around the margins as well for, for notes. And I've added some footnotes as well, you may find beneficial too. Okay, uh, so the layout is very, very, very different. It's very clear. Okay, and it's easy for you to, to find things and to, to memorize uh, rulings as well. And that was, that was my intention uh, with this layout. So. أقول خلي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم الحمد لله رب العالمين. هل يوجد شيء في تأدى؟ نعم ما شاء الله جزاكم الله خيرا. الحمد لله. We've got about fifteen twenty minutes before Maghrib. But I'm just making some notes based off what Sheikh Blal was sharing. Thank you so much, Tim, for an enlightening speech there. Taraweeh. When I first went to Damascus, two thousand and five, we arrived. In Ramadan, so we arrived there. It was ghost town. There was nobody around. Because we were praying tarawih, 
So I didn't pray that night. The second night I went to Taraweeh. Uh, the first record of Taraweeh was as follows. Amin. Hamim. Allahu Akbar. And we were in Ruku. The Shafi mother, by the way, right? They didn't mention Imam Shafi allows taking payment Just for teaching as well. So yeah. the Shafi. Uh, but that was my first experience of Taraweeh outside of our traditional, you know, long records. Like, Wow, it just felt so good. So we, we finished the rabi in literally 20 minutes. We just went in, did the rabi out, and then, you know, the whole of Damascus came to life after the rabi. But I can understand what Sheikh Dal is saying because in that part of the world, and the fatwas that were around what Sheikh Dal was sharing, they weren't in the northern hemisphere or, you know, in the latitude we are, etc., where time is so short in the summer. They are all the time in the world, but they still gave those fatwas. They still mentioned that you should take it easy on people because they are not attending the jamaat. Um, in terms of language, Sheikh Bilal mentioned the spice thing, although it was a good one. Um, in the book itself, Nurli Adah, there's a section on the janaza prayer and the burial. And there's a funny story on the word uh, leban. What's leban? Anyone know what leban is? Milk, yogurt, right? So traditionally yogurt. Um, we use it for milk now. Um, so one of the students was reading the book, and it says when you bury somebody, fill their grave with what? Lam banun, lebin, not leban, lebin. But he read it as leban, so he started putting yogurt into the grave. Right? So it's a story, who knows how true it is, right? But the actual word is lebin, which means clay bricks. Lebin, lebina is a clay brick, right? Or a brick. Uh, so again, the language, you know, when you're reading, you need to be you know, guided through just the basics of the just, language. Just a point on that. Uh, one of the copies of this in Arabic. Does it say that? No, no, it doesn't say it. <laughs> it's even worse. So, so it's supposed to say Ba'da. Yeah. But it actually says Qabla. Oh, yeah, Latif. That's such like yeah. a massive error. And I thought, this doesn't make, make sense. So it's supposed to say afterwards, but instead it says before. <laughs> completely different. It's a completely different word. <laughs> this is one of the Arabic uh, copies. You probably find typos in, in mine, but. That's why teacher. Yeah, no, no, on that, on that point teacher. of mistakes, I uh, got it noted down here. Uh, Sheikh Blal said we make mistakes. We, we, we truly do, unfortunately, and that's part of life. But it reminded me of a, a story of Mambo Hanifa, a little exchange he had with a little boy. There was a little boy playing, and he was walking on like a wall. So as he was walking, Imam Hanifa saw him, and he said, be careful you don't slip, out of concern for the young man. And he turned around to Imam Hanifa, and he said, no, oh, Imam, you be careful you don't slip. And he said, because my slip will damage me and harm me, but mm. your slip will damage the ummah, will hurt the ummah. Mm. You know, and that's the responsibility you see. Mm. And, then, and Imam Nifa, you know, he said, I learned from a child, but he, you know, uh, he was a wise child, mashallah, and there were many of them in those days. But anyway, I would like to open the floor for any questions you have uh, to ask Sheikh Bilal about this topic, inshallah ta'ala. Please don't hesitate, don't be shy. There's not much time, but there's a lot to ask, I hope. Anyone want to start us off? Ladies? Gentlemen? L ladies first. <laughs> Bilal, you look like you got a question. Discussion. You are, you know, your namesake's on stage as well, mashallah. <laughs> oh, we got a PC bash saved here, mashallah. Bashar? Um, will you be teaching this? Or either of you? I don't, haven't planned anything formally yet, but. I think I need to Maybe. catch up to Sheikh Abdul Razak Al Halabi. Mm -hmm. 13 times uh, Hashi Ibn Abidin, which is this it's big, right? But Alhamdulillah, I've taught the book about three times, I think. I, th I think I've um, taught this about eight or nine yeah. times so myself. It's, it's a book you go back to, but and I'm the, not planning on anything. Uh, we, we can do, inshallah. We can Sheikh sort Bilal, something out. Inshallah. One of the. Uh, I what? think you've, now that you're publishing it, maybe it's good to run a course so people can attend and, and learn. Yeah, yeah, maybe. One of the. Uh, one of the ulama in Syria, he, I think he said, he, I taught this book over 90 times. And he says, every time I teach it, I keep finding new things, isn't it? <laughs> he passed away a while ago, rahimahullah. But he's, I've actually got his recordings. I've managed to get hold of some of the recordings of his classes on the on Nuru Idah. And he goes into you know, so much detail for such a, a short text. Mm. Mashallah. You know, and that's, that's one of the secrets of the traditional texts 
they're written in such a way where it, it, it opens so many doors to other things. The wording mm. is so so precise, so, it's yeah. so precise that that the, it was very deliberately chosen to be worded in that way. Mm. To uh, you know, so you should be able to take from a sentence whether it's uh, sunnah, mustahab, uh, mm. or you know, mandu, which one it is, because of the way it's worded. Yeah. it's so precise. I've tried to um, stick as well to the literal wording of the text as much as possible uh, without it being too um, ruin the, the, the meaning too much you know so for example um, it mentions um, when somebody does a takbir in the, in the prayer um, it mentions like um, that when he goes into you know the, the, uh, the bowing position that he should do the takbir uh, and I think, I think it mentions like Sajidan, like in that way, or Rakitan, something like that. So it, it, the way he mentions it is what we call Hal, Hal in Arabic, Arabic grammar. So he uses a Siga Hal, yeah. which means that you, whilst you're doing that action, you're saying the Takabir at the same time. But you can only know that if you, you know the Arabic grammar because it's Mansub, it's in the accusative form. You just read the Arabic, and you didn't know, you know that that nuance and that the Arabic grammar. You wouldn't pick that out of the, so you know the jurists, you know they're very very precise in their language. Mm. Uh, just a question for you, Sheikh Blal. Um, what made you decide to go on this journey of translating, and how was that journey? You know, how was the experience? Um, in translating in general, or translating this, this text, this text, text in particular. This is text. Um, I found that it was the text that benefited me, uh, that I wish I really had when I became Muslim. Mm, I converted to Islam in 1999, you know, and I was given like a, I think it was basic teachings of Islam by Gulam Sarwa or something like that, and you know, you learn your fiqh from these or Ta'lim al Haq or these. Mm these little books, but uh, a lot of the time they weren't sufficient. Uh, so studying this text, you know, when I first started my journey of study and getting benefit from it and... Uh, we actually studied together with the Stats Fatih, remember? <laughs> yeah, 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 we studied together, One of the yeah. times we studied, yeah, I'm sure yeah, we studied it. We studied a few teachers. times yeah. oh, as well. I studied it quite a few times, actually. And um, there's a lot of benefit in it, especially in relation to you know, the prayer and, and fasting and uh, Imam Shurumbulali, he tries to be exhaustive, you know, and he gives like many, many different uh, scenarios. Uh, you know, for example, the, the area of impurities, he gives an exhaustive list of impurities. So you can understand from that that anything that isn't listed here, then it's, it's pure. If it's not here, then you don't need to worry about it. If you, you know, if you're saying that the four uh, pillars of wudu, the four obligatory acts of wudu are this, 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 and this, you can exclude anything else. Okay? It's what we call mafu mukhalifa in usul al fiqh. It's your inference of the opposite. Um, so you can do that from, from text in the Hanafi school. It's a big principle in, in the Shafi school. So, for example, the Messenger of Allah, he says, Matul al ghani zulm. That if a per rich person delays paying off a debt, this is oppression. You can understand the opposite from that. that if it's a poor person, then it's not, it's not zulm, it's not, not oppression. And what Allah says, Walillahi ala nasi hijjul bayti man istata'ilayhi sabila. That people have an obligation to perform hajj. Obligation to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. If whoever is able to to make the way, we understand from this, infer the opposite. Anybody who's unable to make the way, there's no obligation for them to to go. So you can do that in primary texts as well. Most of the time, sometimes there are <laughs> other details as well. But generally, if it's an exhaustive text, you can understand the opposite. If it's not been mentioned here. Because of the jurists, they don't leave any stone unturned. And they realise the, the importance of this, this subject matter. They might 
go into discussions. You think, why is he, why is he telling me this? <laughs> why is he discussing this matter? They have to be thorough. They have to be thorough in everything they do. Just to clarify, when Sheikh Bilal was saying customs, he didn't mean the ones you go through on your way back to England, <laughs> immigration and customs. He meant the customs that we're accustomed to in our society, you know, just to clarify that. <laughs> Somebody might have thought we were talking about immigration and stuff. Customary practices. Customary yeah, practices. customary practices. Some spice you can take customs you can't, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this is a police officer. Is that true? <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. What's the difference between the two books? Ah, that's a good, good question. So, Ascent of Felicity is another uh, text by Imam Shurun Bulali. Uh, it's called Muraqi Sa'adat fi al-ilmay, Tawheed wal Ibadat. Uh, it's called actually Ascensions to Felicitous States in the Two Sciences of uh, Doctrine and Worship. So, in that, that text, it's shorter than this text, Nuru Idah. Uh, it focuses on belief, doctrine. So there's a section, um, maybe four or five pages about doctrine uh, in the beginning. And then he actually covers all the areas of worship as well. So he, he discusses zakat in there, and hajj in there, uh, and even slaughtering animals and, and things like that. And hunting. hunting. There's other, other things in that, that text. Uh, so that, that one is not widespread. Uh, not usually taught as well, uh, but Nuri Idah is something that, you know, if you start off your journey in studying jurisprudence formally in a seminary or, or religious school, you're going to be learning this without a shadow of a doubt. Mm. But the, the, the Alib, they need to work together, they need to work together, so, you know, the doctor shouldn't be given a Sometimes the doctors, they'll say, oh, it's, it's okay for you to, you know, make what the wall fast. Or sometimes they give fatwas, doctors, uh, when they shouldn't be. So they need to work together uh, and discuss, you know, get an idea of what the problem is first. Proper understanding, okay, because one of them knows the religion, the rulings in the religion. The other one knows the medical aspects of it and what effect it might have on the person. So what, what my point was, they shouldn't be working independently of one another. Maybe some scholars, you might have asked about dialysis, maybe Sheikh Hussim's already done research and already discussed it prior to this. Okay, so that might, might be the case, but they shouldn't be giving rulings independently of, of one another. Mm. Yeah, it's a good, good question. And often in Ramadan, I think, because of the breaking the fast and stuff, and when I was in hospital myself, um, you know, you experience things firsthand, so you'd know the rulings because you go through the experience. But um, it's, and like Sheikh Blal mentioned earlier, it's no disgrace in saying, I don't know what that terminology means, because most people don't know medical terminology, right? Uh, we're not, uh, you know, clued up on all the words. So you might say a word like, you know, catheter, and like, what does that mean to, to you know, uh, physically on a body of a person, and what happens through that process? If you've seen it, you've experienced it, it's been explained to you, you could give, like Chris Blau was saying, you know, you could combine the Islamic side with knowing the medical side. Uh, so it's, it's a case of that, knowing the exact process that goes on. And sometimes even the medical side is more nuanced than we think just by using a word or uh, being described a simple uh, process by the patient, for instance. So the doctor will say, no, that's not what's going on in his body. This is what's going on. And this is what's coming in and out and at this point in time, etc." Uh, so that, that's what Sheikh Blau is saying, that, you know, it's not as simple sometimes as, oh, you know, I'm ill, what's the ruling? No, what's your illness? How does it affect you, etc.? Uh, and then a ruling can be given, inshallah. Mm. So it's, 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 it's a lot more nuanced than we, yeah. both sides, than yeah. we, we oft, often think. Um, like I said, I, they've translated the book to be studied with a teacher. Obviously, there is benefit if you don't have access to a teacher and you, you need to find out a ruling about something, it's related to your prayer or, you know, fasting or zakat, then yes, the, you know, the text is here, it, it's in English, if you understand what's being, being said, you know, that's your first resort. Uh, but if you want to seriously understand it, you get a deeper meaning of it, and the meaning of the 
the understanding of the reasonings behind the rulings, you know, then you can only do that with a, with a teacher. You can only do that with a teacher. Mm. Uh, so it's not, it's not for you to go around saying, you know, this is haram. And you, if it's fine, you can say to somebody, well, I read, you know, in Nur Iba, that it, it, it says this. That, that's okay. That's fine. There's no problem. Or uh, Abu Hanifa says that he mentions this. Okay, that way you, you're absorbing yourself of any responsibility. Um, it just depends on, on the teacher, I think. I think um, if we break it down into hourly sessions, maybe 20 or 30 hours, I think. What yeah, no, I was going to say. I think 20, about, about 20 to 30 hours, 30 hours yeah. sessions. That will give, should give you a good understanding uh, with a teacher. Mm. Obviously, you can read it to yourself in one night, probably. Um, but the real understanding is being sat with a teacher. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. So there's a lot more detail here in, in Nur I, I, On mm. that, I think it's a very good question, actually, and I'm going to make a, a very important point. Um, I would say if you've done this book with a teacher, you do it again with a teacher, mm. and again with a teacher, and again with a teacher. There's this concept that we have, maybe because of our Western education systems, uh, you know, that we go through, that studying a book once and passing an exam on it qualifies you, or you've done, and you can move on to the next stage and you know go up this ladder and get any jars at the end. But if you look at traditional scholarship, they worked on something called mastery. And it wasn't about how far you went, it was about the quality. And so they would repeat books again and again. And I, I remember, I think it was Sheikh Mazen that actually told us, he said, uh, one of our pick teachers, one, our pick teacher, he's, he's our pick teacher, to be honest, that's who we took everything from. I heard him say, he said, there's a saying in Arabic, says, Khaf sahiba kitabin wahidin. Be fearful of the person of one book. Meaning, you know, it's not about I did 20 books on fiqh, but I had just done this one book 20 times. Mm. You be fearful in a good sense in that he knows something, yeah, yeah. he will have deep knowledge of that subject. So, you know, be aware, khafi in, more in the sense of have awe of the person who has, you know, knowledge of a book thoroughly. Uh, and that's really important. So I wouldn't say that because you've done one book, you can move to another. I think this idea of repeating uh, mm. books is, is very important in our tradition that we should kind of be spreading and doing ourselves. Mm. Sheikh Adib Kallas used to, you know, they used to call him Sheikh Kitab al Wahid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he used yeah. to only teach, you know, a handful of books, the Ikhtiya, Joharat al Sharh, Joharat al Tawheed, Bajuri, you know, a couple of books, maybe a book in Mantip, that's it. And he said that. He used to just go over those books again and again and again. <laughs> Even in his house, you know, we've got loads of books in our house. He didn't have all those books in his house. And this is one of the greatest jurists, you know, that Damascus has seen in modern times. Teacher of our teacher. Yeah, He's the teacher of our teacher. But he only used to have a few books. And, you know, we'd just go over those, those books again and again and again. Thank you, Sheikh. Uh, appreciate your time and efforts and everything. And 